This is the third of the three custom mandolins that I had Bruce Weber build. I picked the woods for this particular instrument and the woods of the uh, Adirondack instrument you just saw during a trip to Montana in 2006. Um, Sound of Earth acquired a very large stash of some 30 to 50 year old tone woods and it was time to go cherry pick for an instrument or two or three or as many as I could afford and uh, it was really a worthwhile investment. This one just arrived a few months ago. It's, it's uh, very, very new to me, uh, but I'm becoming fond of it very quickly. This instrument was very different from the first two instruments in that we not only wanted a different kind of wood for sound, but we also wanted a completely different look. This instrument was to, built to be a very non-traditional looking instrument, and the colors and the selection of woods also made it relatively non-traditional sound-wise too, though it's a very, very pleasing tone. Notice that there is a round quality to the tone, much as the first cedar top had. Um, that's probably because the top on this instrument is a form of cedar. It's called Port Orford Cedar, and Port Orford Cedar is the hardest of all the Cypress family. It's not quite as hard as Sitka Spruce, but it's approaching that stiffness. It's a very, very hard cedar. This particular top wood was cut in 1952, and you'll notice as you're looking closely at the top that there are some unevenness in the color on the top. Port Orford uh, cedar is notorious for not wanting to accept stain in a very, very homogeneous manner. And I didn't have a problem with that. I frankly I love the look of it. Um, and I knew that I was to expect that before I chose the, to do the top in this color. And it almost creates a distressed like look with the changes in color as you go across the top, but it's actually just the way that the stain was taken on the wood. This instrument also has some bells and buzzers that most mandolins that you see out in the bluegrass world don't have. It has herringbone binding on the front and back of the instrument and I'll show you the reverse in a few minutes. It also has bound F-holes. They're bound in white and then bound in black. And it creates just a gorgeous look in the F-holes. It's kind of a hard thing for a luthier to do, as is the herringbone binding for tight corners like these are. But uh, the kind of work that they do at Weber is just exemplary of the craftsmanship it takes to do this kind of work. If you look in the corners where the binding meets, you'll find that it ends up coming out evenly in the pattern with the grain of the binding. It's just every little detail is just gorgeous. One other aspect of having the bound F-holes on a top is that it, it stiffens the top just a little bit. And uh, that may contribute to this also having a kind of a dry punch like you hear with a bluegrass mandolin. And you get that kind of a round tone from the cedar as well. So it's a very, very interesting wood, Port Orford Cedar. This instrument also has a pit garden armrest and a wood nymph, just as I have on the other mandolins. We did something a little different in finishing this instrument. After we put the tiger yellow stain on, which is the color that we used, it has a koa armrest, a koa pit guard, and the overlay on the headstock is also koa. And we tongue oil finished all of those three so that the lacquer body is gloss and the tongue oil finish is a satin finish and it doesn't have the bright reflective thing. And what the tongue oil in addition does um, on the koa is that it causes the inlay to stand out and the binding colors to stand out. So it's really a beautiful way to make the colors pop with that inlay and bring them out. On the inlay on the headstock of this instrument, instead of the traditional fern pattern that we used on the last two, we used a Celtic torch, which is one of Bruce's um, 
available inlay designs. It was one that I favored and thought was great to go with a non-traditional mandolin. The fingerboard on this instrument is arched, just as the other two mandolins were, and it's an 8 radius, and again we have the wide neck, as we had before. The sides and back are also maple. The back on this particular instrument is a quarter sawn maple, and it's one piece, and the quarter sawing gives the maple uh, more of a stiffness than it would be with the slab cut like we used on the Adirondack spruce top. This particular instrument has a, just a gorgeous piece of wood for the back, and the tiger yellow really makes that, that flame in the maple just pop out. It's a really quite a, a unique look, and we'll get it under some bright lights and have you a chance to, to see that a little closer in this video. Something very non-traditional that we did in the finish, um, I wanted to try a tongue-oiled neck and I had felt them before and thought that the tongue oil gave a feeling as if you're playing on raw wood and it really does so the instrument is tongue oiled finished from the neck out and the entire back of the neck where you're fingering it has that tongue oil finish and it's very very smooth and it's hard to describe but it's a uh, it's extremely soft and smooth and feels like very fine sanded wood that's bare that doesn't even feel like there's finish on it and it makes you really feel like you're part of the instrument while you're playing it and it doesn't have the sticky feel like lacquer does when it gets hot either it stays feeling like that so this is the third of the three custom mandolins and this model is actually the elite um, there was a model change offering a design that they called the elite um, just in the last year or so at Weber and this one came out after that period and uh, they are just just gorgeous instruments and these woods being 30 to 50 years old make for a sound that you're not going to get in a young wood in the same way and the woods very stable so it's changing over time with temperature and humidity should be a lot less drastic than with younger wood <laughs> I'd like to show you my octave mandolin. <laughs> 